Zambia is a country that is endowed with many natural resources. These range from water bodies as well as wildlife. However, some of the wildlife species that are unique to Zambia are vulnerable or at risk of being trafficked to different places for various reasons. Today on News in Depth, we'll be looking at the subject of wildlife trafficking. We'll be learning more about this subject as well as trying to establish what is being done to ensure that it is curbed in the country. Welcoming you to the program, my name is Penifa Nurenda. A custom modified plane captured by the Zambian authorities in the month of October 2015. This is probably a landmark development in the history of Zambia, from the understanding that those involved were trying to move these sable antelopes out of the borders of the country. Those allegedly behind it were captured and are currently undergoing a court process to determine their fate. Incidences of illegal wildlife trade make headlines around the world from time to time. Wildlife trade certainly takes many dimensions and illegality is not eluded. Animal trafficking is the illegal movement of wildlife, including live animals and dead animals, including whole animals and any animal parts or derivatives. So everything from a pet parrot, a pet lizard, all the way to animal skins and pelts, zebra skins, to very high value items that are traded on the black market illegally, including some of the highest priced items, ivory, rhino horn, pangolin scales. So trafficking in general is just the illegal movement of contraband, illegal goods, and wildlife unfortunately is among these that we're realizing are moved, both in high volume, large distances, and often through organized networks. The World Wildlife Fund, WWF, believes wildlife trade is mainly conducted within national borders, but that there is a large volume of wildlife trade internationally. What, however, makes wildlife trade a problem is the extent of illegality. Like drug barons, dealers in wildlife and wildlife products find ways and means of getting their contraband to targeted destinations. The business appears to be getting more complex with the progression of time and the 21st century has hit record volumes of imports and exports of wildlife contrabands. The extent of the business only reflects in the depleting wildlife populations in countries that are targeted for wildlife produce. WWF Zambia describes illegal wildlife trade as a huge problem affecting many countries around the world. As far as I'm concerned, it is a big crisis and uh, it's something that warrants global efforts. Um, national and regional efforts are enough, I mean, are not enough. They are necessary but not sufficient to deal with the complicated nature of the, of the crime. Statistics confirm the gravity of this problem. It's really something that's of global concern. When you look at the numbers, they are slightly alarming and we should be alarmed as a continent, um, as a country, we should be alarmed. When you look at the numbers, um, a report by One Earth that was published in 2013 for the periods 2012 and 2013 highlighted that just over 30,000 elephants were hunted or poached for their tusks. Now, of course, this is really of concern because that's a huge figure for that period. And then when you look at other animals, such as the rhino, um, in 2007, we have figures such as 5,000 um, rhinos being poached for their tasks as well. The, 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 the numbers of uh, rhinos poached in South Africa rising from uh, 13 in 2007 to 1,214 in 2014. So within a period of 10 years, approximately, uh, you, uh, rather seven years, you are talking of uh, almost a 900% increase. Uh, we're talking of uh, uh, Zimbabwe losing 30% of uh, rhino in the last decade, and uh, Namibia, as an example, also in 2010 there was no rhino poached, in 2014, we were talking of 24 rhinos, and uh, by April 2015, we were talking of uh, approximately 70. 
The United States government simply describes this as a global crisis. The more evidence we get from airports, ports around the world, we're realizing that it's a, a very common and uh, voluminous trade in illegal products, and it's rapidly depleting the few wilderness areas left in the world in order to feed the appetite of consumer markets. Traffic, an international wildlife trade monitoring network, estimates that the legal trade of wildlife products into the EU zone alone was worth an estimated 93 billion euros in 2005, and this increased to nearly 100 billion euros in 2009. Traffic has estimates of wildlife traded in Europe between 2000 and 2005. These include 3.4 million lizards, 2.9 million crocodiles, and 3.4 million snake skins. The network notes that not all trade is legal. Further statistics show that between 2003 and 2004, EU enforcement authorities made more than 7,000 seizures, totaling over 3.4 million specimens listed by the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species CITES. Between 2005 and 2009, the figures grew as the EU enforcement authorities made over 12,000 seizures of illegal wildlife products. In the recent past, the US and China are leading destinations for both legal and illegal wildlife products. China has emerged in the past decade as a major consumer of ivory. And some of the explanations given for that are that uh, the buying power of China has increased so rapidly. So not only are there more middle class and upper class Chinese citizens able to afford luxury products, but there's also a vast number. It's, it's an incredible volume of consumers. And so now that they have emerged as a dominant economy, it's, it's simply an issue of buying power and the desire of the product there. On a global scale, it's something that's really sort of gotten um, attention and we've seen a lot of investment being put into addressing this as a challenge. Um, for instance, um, America, which is the second largest market for trafficked um, animal products as well as other wildlife products, has actually made a move to try and ensure that, you know, this issue and this challenge is addressed. So that's also encouraging. Um, you've seen um, international institutions such as the United Nations Environmental Programme and uh, WWF also stepping up their efforts to try and address trafficking and wildlife trafficking and poaching. The U.S. government is aware of its contributing role in the escalation of illegal wildlife trade. The U.S. is a major consumer of all products, um, wildlife and non-wildlife, and we acknowledge ourselves as part of the problem. Um, when we say that we are one of the biggest consumers of wildlife in the world, that actually also includes legal wildlife that is moving under permit, including wood, timber, plants, etc. In terms of illegal product, again, we admit we are part of the problem, uh, but we feel that we have had improvement in recent years. But how much of a problem is wildlife trafficking in Zambia? Wildlife trafficking um, in Zambia is a bit of a problem uh, because we, we play host to some of the endemic species uh, of uh, wildlife in the country uh, and uh, in the world. So, uh, for example, like the Kafue Lechwe, the, the, the Black Lechwe in Banguelu, um, and also really not endemic, but um, we have a rare species of um, the Kafue uh, sable. Zambia is in the rain states, is part of the rain states for, for example, elephants. And uh, Zambia is both a source place as a result and also uh, uh, a transit route. Remember, we are landlocked. So our porous borders are being used by the criminal syndicates behind uh, these uh, uh, criminal activities of uh, illegal wildlife trade. So we are actually in the eye of the storm 
as far as I'm concerned. I think for Zambia, even though we currently don't have, we're not as challenged as some other countries within the continent in terms of wildlife trafficking, we've, we've seen a, a few incidences here and there, but not as high as other countries. We should still be concerned because um, wildlife trafficking and poaching is largely attributed to a few key factors, um, such as poverty, issues of food security, and also a growing um, middle class within the countries that import these uh, wildlife products. Is Zambia as a country a vulnerable destination of wildlife trafficking? Well, in terms of uh, vulnerability, I mean, it's, it's something that is illegal. And uh, I can't say we are too vulnerable or we are... Um, the, 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 the fact remains that it is an illegal business uh, where people, even where the law prohibits certain activities, uh, these activities still go on. We, we are vigilant just to ensure that uh, uh, this particular uh, vice uh, does not get out of hand. Kasanka Trust, which runs two national parks in central province of Zambia, including the Kasanka and Lavushimanda National Parks, has a variety of animal and bird species, some of which are only endemic to Zambia. The park has had its own unconfirmed experiences in losing certain species. For Kasanka in particular, uh, when we were still running the Bangweulu wetlands, we did hear of a lot of episodes suspected where the showbill eggs were being trafficked uh, to be taken out um, and even uh, people seeking to uh, get the black lechway uh, from its area. Uh, so this is a big problem uh, because it defrauds people of the resources that uh, they have and uh, it's something that must be fought uh, corporately so that we win and the traffickers don't win. Government is aware of such incidences taking place within the borders of Zambia, more especially the alleged airlifting of these animals. This is why an investigation of all airstrips has been effected. We are aware as government that uh, uh, animals are being um, um, uh, trafficked uh, from various places into the, our neighboring countries and especially South Africa. There are a lot of um, airstrips that we, uh, we that are not under the control of government, which private airstrips which have been opened all over the country. And uh, my ministry has put in measures to see to it that first of all, Zawa must account for all the airstrips that are found in the game park, especially in the game park and near near the game park, in the GMA. So we need to get a, a, an account of how many there are and what type of uh, activities go, go on in those areas. Are there particular animals more vulnerable to be trafficked than others? It's difficult to say, you know, I mean, rather spe specifying species. I would say all wildlife because it's, it's growing. Um, we would talk about elephants, rhinos, you know, the more charismatic species. Um, but you are seeing, you know, animals such as pangolins, for example, which uh, were not trafficked. Uh, that much, you know, a few years back, but you, you, you they actually uh, traffic more than any other animal at, at the moment. The sable antelope from Zambia. Zambian sable is worth every weight in gold, if not platinum, and uh, that has seen uh, that has been auctioned, say in South Africa, for millions of rands. Um, and uh, uh, it's taken away from this place illegally and taken out. Um, uh, and then, as I said, in terms of Kasanka, we've also uh, had indications that there is a possibility certain unscrupulous people were trafficking eggs for the showbill, as well as seeking to get the black lechware, which is endemic to that area. No, we're just talking about animals, animals. But there is also bird species that are being trafficked out of this country. There is uh, tortoises that are being trafficked out of this country. Certain snakes species are being trafficked. Certain bird species like the carmine bee eaters are being trafficked. Parrots, uh, you're talking about the pangolins. It's not just the iconic species. The commercial value of these animals is what seems to be propagating this illegal activity. Most recently, Zawa confirms that a Zambian sable antelope during a South African auction fetched for a staggering 27 million rands. Sable 
Um, on the legal market, I would uh, give an example in South Africa, for example, where live specimens are sold on auction. Um, the latest being one Zambian sable sold for as much as 27 million rands. So sable uh, um, is an animal so that's uh, been targeted by illegal wildlife trade as evidenced by the recent uh, um, arrest and seizure of sables. Religion, food and fuel, as well as medicinal use of some of the animal products allegedly captured by poachers and others involved in illegal wildlife trade contributes to the growth of this activity. Demand has superseded the sustainable supply of these wildlife products. Animals are um, in demand in different parts of the world for different purposes and different uses. Uh, and the, the market shifts with consumer trade and unfortunately fashion really. Um, the, the desire and the use and the appeal of wild products does change, as do the markets. Trophy hunting also adds to the list of factors contributing to the high rate of animals being sought by illegal wildlife products dealers. Hunting of certain species, uh, we need to tighten the monitoring, we need to tighten the, the, the rules uh, and ensuring that, you know, what happened in Zimbabwe was most unfortunate about uh, Cecil the lion and uh, we don't want those sorts of things to be happening everywhere. We do see the role of sport hunting, in other words paid legal hunting, as a mechanism to fund ongoing conservation of areas. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is um, that, that often this theoretical ideal of sport hunting paying appropriate values in a transparent manner for the removal of a sustainable number of animals. Like other forms of trade, wildlife resources around the world can benefit those who own them. People are not supposed to be that poor when they are living in the, uh, amidst uh, plenty of uh, resources like wildlife. And uh, you know, we can develop in certain parts of the country wildlife-based economies which are more sustainable than short-term agriculture and uh, charcoal production, for example. So we need to have the bigger picture and uh, look at how we can best use uh, the wildlife resources. What are the consequences of losing wildlife in the social development of a country like Zambia? In the GMAs, uh, the communities uh, get revenue from, from hunting and without uh, wildlife uh, that can be hunted, then the communities uh, deprive themselves of, of revenue. So the proprietors and the actual institutions would suffer. So if you're talking about a game reserve, um, a lodge that is built there, the company would suffer because then it would have less tourists coming. Why are they coming to that area? They're coming to, for the game viewing, um, for the wildlife tourism. So if there's no wildlife, that means that you'll have a less uh, your flow of tourists reduces, work for the local community reduces, work and business for the local service providers reduces. So in a whole, it's really something that is a complex issue. It would affect an entire community and other dependent communities that are dependent on uh, the wildlife tourism in that particular community. Kasanka Trust has its own story to tell on the social benefits of its investments in the two parks under its care. We have schools and we have clinics that we have built. Some of them out of the philanthropy of the people who love to come and visit uh, Kasanka. Um, we also have a conservation center called David Livingston Conservation Center uh, where uh, people come and also we have a lot of schools. I can mention particularly uh, you know, the Italian School of Lusaka as well as uh, uh, the International School of Lusaka. So uh, we create employment. So for instance in the new Chitambo district today, uh, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the people being employed there are employed around conservation work through the Kasanka Trust. The economic loss seems to be more prominent. Economically, Zambia is losing out because uh, illegal wildlife trade can be termed as, as economic sabotage because you are depriving the country, the country of, its, uh, uh, of, of, its, of revenue that would, uh, would contribute to the treasury. 
Livingstone would grant a hot, South Luang would grant a hot, but you know Lower Zambezi would grant uh, grant a hot. The reasons are vast, and uh, we need to really think about the opportunities that we are losing as a result of unsustainable utilization of wildlife resources, including wildlife crimes. Uh, that wildlife resource is usually the property of that country, that national park, or that community that has hosted and fed and tolerated that animal for decades. And under the right program of tourism or well-managed sport hunting, the animal had the potential to bring revenue to that community or that park or that village or that country. And by removing it illegally, that entire payment program is circumvented. Depletion of animal resources is an even bigger worry for those against unsustainable trade in wildlife and wildlife products. What will we pass on to the succeeding generations? If we get, uh, uh, if these are depleted now, then we will not have what we must use, uh, for which define us as a people. Uh, so, uh, yes, on both the social and economic fronts, we have everything to lose. Um, uh, because of this uh, trafficking, which is basically unfair trade. With the advancement in technology, are there contributing factors to the growth of illegal wildlife trade? The criminal syndicates are actually using the technology in some instances. You know, by you not realizing that you need to take a photograph of a rhino somewhere using a mobile phone, you post it on Facebook. Criminal syndicates will know the exact coordinates and they will use your unintentional sharing of the nice picture for their uh, uh, perverted motives. On the other hand, progress is being made to devise technological strategies that can deal with this problem of illegal wildlife trade. Technology is a, is a certain, is, a, is an important uh, tool all along the way, from poaching to trafficking to uh, demand reduction. But we, um, you know, often people look for that um, panacea that's going to fix everything. And people have, we think, overinflated ideas that some magical technology or invention is going to solve the whole thing. Unfortunately, it's still going to require a lot of work. Um, that would involve the actual detection of contraband wildlife products moving along the chain and the interception of those products. And there is, I would say, a lot of promising technology in that regard. There is nonetheless acknowledgement that basic methods of monitoring, including foot patrols and monitoring by members of the community in wildlife parks, has been seen as a more effective option in protecting wildlife. We, we are vigilant just to ensure that uh, uh, this particular uh, vice uh, does not get out of hand. Uh, and that is, that is the more reason why we have these particular partnerships with the, the other law enforcement agencies of the state, with the local communities, just to ensure that uh, uh, we keep uh, this particular vice in check. It's, it's back to simple, old ways of doing things. Having eyes in the field and having an established anti-poaching force in an area is your first line of protection. In Zambia, this is limited by the shortage of staff by the country's wildlife management authority, ZAWA. We are, we are running at half, half capacity in terms of uh, human resource in um, uh, police officers in Zawa. And uh, like I always say that we need to recruit more uh, Zawa officers. We are running at 1,500 instead of 3,500. Zawa recognizes its limitations, hence appreciating the role members of the community have played in the execution of duties mandated to them. We are a bit limited as an institution and so we depend on informers who are out there to give us information and once we are given these particular leads we've, we make follow-ups uh, just to ensure that uh, if there's anything illegal that is happening uh, we, we move in to rectify or just to ensure that people comply and if uh, people are not complying there are penal sanctions that do attend under the Wildlife Act. A global and regional approach is being recommended in dealing with wildlife offences. It is not something that Zambia can do alone. We need to find ways as a country to position ourselves strategically in terms of how we can work with our neighboring countries. Just yesterday I learned that uh, uh, a major operator 
from Tanzania was arrested uh, maybe a couple of days ago, but his syndicate runs through the region. Punishment on offenders as a preventive measure is being promoted by those concerned with the high rate of wildlife species being trafficked. I, uh, I, I frequently say, for example, you get seven years for uh, cattle rustling uh, and uh, you don't get as much a sentencing for, uh, if you like, poaching a sable bull, which is, economically speaking, possibly even 10, 20 times the value. The, the, the good part is that um, if you're caught illegally exporting, for example, uh, it is an offence under the uh, Wildlife Act, and uh, it, it uh, carries under the new uh, Wildlife Act uh, uh, a man mandatory minimum sentence of uh, imprisonment. So it shows you the seriousness, and even just the attempt to export without the necessary documentation uh, is an offence. So these are offences that go without an option of a fine. And so uh, that is uh, the seriousness that has been attached uh, to fighting this, this particular vice. The tourism minister, Jean Kapata, equally feels punishment on offenders involved in illegal wildlife trade should be enhanced, hence her ministry's proposal to have such cases non-bailable. As a minister, I think I'm not satisfied in the sense that, uh, you know, in our neighboring countries, they have uh, very strict uh, laws to an extent where people are scared to go and poach. Uh, I won't name the countries, but there are some countries within the, within the region who, uh, when poachers are found, they say shoot on sight. And uh, Zambia is a Christian nation, and I wouldn't want us to go that way, but I would want us to review the law to an extent where we put it as a non available offense. The minister also feels that the problem needs a regional remedial strategy. She has also disclosed that her defense counterpart has already commenced a working partnership with Botswana. The, the president in his speech during the opening of uh, parliament, he did actually um, direct the minister of defense to come and uh, partner with the minister of tourism in keeping uh, uh, poaching. And uh, my colleague uh, from the minister of defense has since traveled uh, to Botswana uh, to, to meet with the, uh, his counterpart to see how it's working for Botswana. And uh, a report is, uh, has been written and it's on my desk. So we are going to uh, partner with the armed forces. Another submission proposes determining the animal population in order to devise protective measures to be implemented. As PMRC, we do feel that continued efforts need to be made, continued investments need to be made, Firstly, we need to make investments towards ensuring that we actually know our animal numbers. So we need to conduct animal census, an animal census, in order to sort of understand what figures we're working with. And this will help us also implement um, management interventions that speak to whether we're actually trying to grow our particular animal population or we need to reduce uh, the numbers so that then the ecosystem is properly supported. Realization that wildlife trade involves many countries calls for collaborative efforts in dealing with the consequences of illegal wildlife trade. For countries like Zambia, which are on a path to diversification of the economy, huge responsibilities to ensure protection of natural resources like wildlife fauna and flora should be a priority. Closing the gaps contributing to increased illegalities in wildlife trade is an even greater task ahead. As WWF states, human life depends on the existence of a functioning planet Earth, careful and thoughtful use of wildlife species and their habitats is required to avoid not only extinctions but serious disturbances to the complex web of life. This is where we conclude this week's presentation of News in Depth. We've been looking at the subject of wildlife trafficking, particularly trying to find out what is being done to ensure that it doesn't occur in Zambia. Well, I'd like to thank you so much for making time to watch our program this week. We are back at the very same time with another interesting subject next week. Thank you so much for your time. I'm Penny Fanyurenda. Goodbye and God bless you. <music>